Okay, so I would like first to say thank you to Ignacio that invited me to this conference and for everyone else, to Nikolai and to Ralph uh, for hosting this uh, conference. And I'm very glad to be here and I hope that uh, my contribution can help uh, all the other participants to, to keep on thinking about these things. My project is in the beginning of its research, so this is more like a sharing of some intuitions that I have been uh, working on, and I would very glad um, I would be very glad to to have some questions and suggestions after this small presentation, um, and I'm very I'm looking forward to to that exchange. I'm really sorry for my English because sometimes I get confused. Uh, I, I, I was traveling today by train and it was like uh, German, French, uh, and now um, the, the driver was from Brazil, so it was um, Portuguese, and now, uh, sorry, so if I make a mistake, you will forgive me. Okay, so my intuition is that the concept of, the concept of life is perhaps even more important than the notion of being in Western philosophical thought. I mean, we should ask ourselves if perhaps our very notion of being, as being something, is not being predicated by some features of our own life experience. Because first we have our life being experienced by ourselves. And then we go to the world and see that it is surrounded by things. So perhaps, my intuition is, perhaps we think about things as being animated things. But I will go slow because it's like crazy to put it like that way. But, and then what I would like to do is to question what is life? for Western thought. Has our concept of life changed during these thousand and thousand of years? Could we get or grasp some structure, some semantical structure within the discourses, the many discourses on life? That is my, my question. So what I found is that perhaps the best way to define what life is is by a political concept, that is the one of autarky. That means to be self-sufficient. So that's why I put here in, as a title, self-sufficiency as a biotheological paradigm. I will try to show, because uh, this is part of the, the essence of the project, to try to uh, show that it is not something about philosophy, or about theology, or about science, but it's about an ideological paradigm that concerns the three great <laughs> branches of our disciplines. Then what I mean is that perhaps we can find a concept of life that is the self-sufficient life, not only in philosophical works, but also in, biologi uh, in biologists, and also, mainly, in theology. So. so what's life? The first thing we should ask is, is life prior to our concepts, or is it our concepts uh, prior to our living experience? Because sometimes we get this existentialist or vitalist reflection that that would tell us, okay, to know what life is, you just first live your life and then we, we should reflect on it. No? However, the thing is that our own experience, and here I'm, I am talking uh, from an hermeneutical tradition, from our very simple life experience, there are already a lot of concepts going on there. So it is not like um, a simple a syllogism or a simple um, calculation that is first life and then we have the concepts that has to reflect on life 
but life is already being reflected in our activity, and our activity is already being conceptualized by our, uh, by our ideology, by our paradigm where we live at. So, when we think about life, the second difficulty is that life is not a univocal concept. It is not a concept that we can uh, define only by biology, or only by theology, or only by philosophy. But the concept of life has many, many senses, many meanings, coming from very different perspectives. You, today we know that, for instance, George Agamben has made uh, like uh, the, the, the difference between bios and soe as a, a thing that is strategic to his biopolitics program and so on. And leaving that aside, it is true that for us, life is not being only living, breathing, or our heart pumping. It also means to have a good life, for instance, to be happy or to be in some certain mood. So we could find in the concept of life discourse, political discourses, ethical discourses, biological discourses, and then we see also theological ones. Now, the thing is that for, to speak about life, the first analogon, let's, excuse, this, excuse me for this word, no? you know, analogy, I'm thinking about the analogy of attribution. No? When you say that something is alive, why do you say that? Or where do you, uh, from where are you departing? So for me, the, the, the main analogon, I, I think that perhaps you will agree with me, is our own life experience. So, as, a, as we are living, we say that other things are alive. But the difficulty here, again, when we speak about life, oh, everything is difficult, is that as soon as we establish some certain analogy between our own life or our own living experience and what we call a living being, an inversion takes place. So, a bug is a living being, okay, An organ a microcellular organism is alive, okay. So perhaps now we take that kind of living as the main analogon. So we say, ah, so we are alive as the microorganism is alive. So we, can, we have like a biological reduction. No? And we start to imagine that our life is or paradigmatically, uh, that we have to find it paradigmatically in the microorganisms. Or the other way around, we say God is alive. But not now, from our point of view, but now God is the paradigmatic living being. So now our lives will be interpreted from the life of God. So every time that you put an analogy, you have this uh, possibility of the inversion. We would, I think we start from our kind of being, but as soon as we say that something else is alive, then this inversion could, could happen. And we will see that it happens. So we know that the first great, well, no, sorry, not the first, but I mean one of the main uh, thinkers on life has been Aristotle. For Aristotle, you know that everything is moving in the world. The feature of all natural entities is movement. However, what makes life something precious, something different from all the other things in the world, is not movement, but the capacity that the thing has to move from itself, and by those movements to improve their own internal dynamics. That is what it means, both concepts, immanence and spontaneity. Living beings are spontaneous because they do not need another thing that moves them, but they can move from themselves. And immanence because their movements are not transitive, are not transitive, sorry. They are not uh, supposed to just uh, be deposited in something else. But everything that a living being does, somehow, Take, makes an impact in its own 
vital dynamics. That, that means in English. So if we have living beings and we have natural things, we have to think that the bodies in question are different. We have to go from a summa physicon, that is merely a physical body, a physical body, to a soma organicon. That would mean an organized body. So here comes this notion of organon. That you know that organon is at the same time um, a tool. I mean, it means tool or something that we use for something else. It has a, a technical uh, uh, meaning. And also organon, that uh, when we speak about our heart or our uh, lung or whatever. So this um, double meaning makes uh, things quite interesting. The one, the, the principle that is the responsible for organizing the whole body to make it something organicon is psyche or soul. Soul is for Aristotle the first form of a living being. It's the first act of a body that has potentially life. So why I put psyche as arche? Because psyche is arche. Arche means a principle. It's the principle of life. And it is principle because it's an economic principle. Because it's the principle that disposes everything in the body to function in some way that the whole of the living being is alive and is progressing in life. The main objective of psyche is to get the body alive and maintain it so. For that, it needs other kind of beings. However, what is important in Aristotle's mind is not that need of another, because he already started saying that life is something of self-movement. What is really important for Aristotle is that life is autosufficient is autarkic. And we can see that very clearly when he speaks about God. Because for him, God is the perfect living being. Why is the perfect living being? Because he is noesis noesius, would be thought of thought. is the highest degree of life. And the highest degree of life means that it does not need anything else to live but itself. That's why in its thinking, its own thought, he is alive. And he's absolutely impassable and immovable. He doesn't need anything, nor anything can change him. We started in Aristotle. And we can say, OK, Aristotle was one of the founders of, uh, of modern biology. We can, we can uh, think about that. But we can think, well, but 2,000 years or more, has passed. So is it our biological concept of life still the same? Is it still being thought within the frame of the concept of autarky, of autosufficiency? We can find in George Canguilhem um, paper one text that is quite interesting. He says, a remarkable and interesting fact from the epistemological standpoint is the proliferation of terms containing the prefix autos, self, used today by biologists to describe the functions and behaviors of organized systems. Auto-organization, auto-reproduction, auto-regulation, auto-immunization, and so on. We can find, for instance, in Umberto Maturana and Francisco Varela's theory of autopoiesis, a very good example of what Canguilhem is saying. And Canguilhem wrote that paper the same year that um, the, the work of uh, Maturana and Varela appeared. So uh, the, he didn't know about this new uh, book. But it, it, it is like a, a sign of the, of the times. I don't know how to say it in English. Yeah. For Maturana and Varela, 
in the opposite shore of Aristotle, living beings has no teleological dynamics, nor has any um, immaterial principle as a soul, no? but they, are, they must be thought of as being machines. So we, have, we are in a mechanistic, uh, biological standpoint. Now, what, uh, however, if we look closely, what defines the living beings are not being machines, because we can find a lot of machines, but that they are autopoietic machines. Autopoietics, that comes from two words. Autos is self, and poiesis in Greek, in Greek is uh, production, creation. It's interesting because when his, uh, Maturana was first uh, thinking about his theory, he was thinking more about uh, other terms, like um, self-reference of, uh, of the living beings, and then he thought about uh, autopraxis. The thing is that, um, he, he, he tells this in a preface, he was talking with a philosopher, uh, uh, with a friend of him, that I was a Spanish philosopher, uh, and he was talking about El Quixote. No? The, I don't know how to say it in English, El Quixote, uh, the Quixote, I don't know. Um, and, and they were talking about literature. And then he realized the, the difference between praxis and poiesis. Praxis, is, it's, all, it's only a, an accidental thing of living beings. Or, I mean, to, praxis means to do something. But poiesis is much more radical. So he realized that what defined living beings is not that they could move or act from themselves, but that their very, very being is produced by themselves. They, know, they don't need anything else to be alive. That is what he's trying to tell Maturana and Varela. And that's why the living being is characterized by individuality, unity, and lack of inputs and outputs. It, it's like uh, a closed domain or a closed territory, the living being. And that territory is produced by the living being itself. Doesn't matter which kind of body or which kind of material the living being has. The important is the formal perspective. Is that the living being produces by its own relations the very unity of living. Doesn't matter if, perhaps, I'm, I mean, Maturana sa says we could think about a machine like uh, uh, an electronic machine that could be alive as long as it can produce its own dynamics and its own processes and its own uh, territory or place or space uh, that needs to, uh, for, to, in order to be alive. That's why it doesn't matter the, the material perspective. It matters the formal perspective. And then we find some link with Aristotle. No? Because the CH is obviously a, a form a principle, not a material one. So why I put here from biology to ethics and back? Because I was speaking at first about the pluribosity of life. So one could think, oh, OK, he's a, a biologist, so he is very objective in his studies, in his theories, in his notions, in his concepts. He's not at all uh, thinking about human life, nor human politics, so on. However, he says this. These thoughts made me realize, these thoughts about autopoiesis and living beings, made me realize and accept that the meaning of my life was my own duty and my own responsibility. However, they also made me realize that the autonomous being of the living reside in the fact that all their vital operations are only due to themselves and that these operations don't emerge from any purpose nor relation in which the result guided the course of the processes that were their origin. So we can see how a reflection on mere biology has an ethical counterpoint. At the same time, I, don't, I didn't put it here, but Varela, also in the preface to the, the books, is, is saying, well, we, we were in the middle, in the, in the 70s, in the middle of the existentialist, hermeneutical uh, traditions being born and being 
put into um, into public public uh, um, year. Uh, so all of that made also our theory possible. It's not that the, uh, uh, a biological theory comes from nowhere. There are some ethical, political, human concepts that are playing in the very essence of biological terms or concepts. I'm, I think I must run, no? Yeah, I have to go quickly. Five minutes, yeah, okay, so yeah. I, I will try not to piss off God in five minutes, but <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. So, we have, uh, we have taken a, a philosopher as Aristotle, we have taken, uh, for some, uh, are merry examples, but uh, Maturana, and now uh, let's see, when, okay, is God alive? When we, when we, have, we are thinking about this, this self-sufficiency as the paradigm to define um, life, okay, uh, that, uh, could we apply it to God? We have seen that in Aristotle, this God was an indifferent, impassable, unchangeable, unmovable one. It's the uh, first uh, unmoved mover. No? Uh, now, we can think, okay, that, that was Aristotle, he was a philosopher. But let's see in the Christian tradition, where, where, where we have a revelation of God, God being present with us. Uh, let's take a, a theologian. So I chose Thomas Aquinas. Perhaps somebody said, well, you're, you're, making, uh, you're cheating because uh, he is um, quite Aristotelian. Okay, yes, I know. I know, yeah. If we take Thomas Aquinas, the Summa Theologica, we will find that the reflections on God's life is in the first part of the Summa that is called on the one God. And it is after a, a series of uh, characteristics of features of God. Simplicity, eternity, I don't remember them all now. Uh, unity. And after, uh, the, I, I don't remember if there are six features of God, comes in the middle of this part, God's life. After God's life, we will find, first of all, the intelligence, then the will, and the justice, mis misericordia, and so on. So, this has to put us, uh, we have to be careful with this. No? For Thomas Aquinas, God is also an eternal and perfect living being, because his life is an intelligent one. And the intelligence is the only capacity of life that is not bound to its subject. It's the only one. Every other vital uh, activity needs some object to be uh, developed, but not intelligence. Intelligence is the only one that could uh, identify its own activity with its own objectivity. It's the only one. That's why God is the perfect and living being. In, in this way, uh, Saint, uh, Thomas is an Aristotelian. Why? Because he also, when he speaks about God's life, the first, uh, oh, the first part of, of that question is what is life? And for him, life is also the capacity to move from itself and by itself. So it's just a question of, of uh, logic. If life is defined by that, then God is the living, the perfect living being, then God is authority, is the autarchic living being. But what about Moltmann? Okay, we have, uh, we, 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 we take Aquinas, he's Aristotelian, okay, let's take Jürgen Moltmann's theology. He's still alive, he's a, uh, it's quite old, but he's alive. Uh, he can be autarchic. Uh, so, uh, what has he says about theology of life? This is very interesting because for him, as a forerunner, the question on God must not be um, within the frame of the one God, as if we thought of God as being one substance with one essence, but must be addressed in, uh, within the frame of Trinity. So the, the problem with Aquinas was that 
God's life was in the part of the on the one God and not in the Trinitarian part of God. You see why? No? If it was in the Trinitarian, then relationship would be the essence of life and not autosufficiency. I don't have time to, 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 to speak of this, but if we take Molman's theology of life, although he tries to stress the importance of the crucified God, the one that dies for us, that that would mean, okay, so God is alive, not because he's authoritative, but he really is, needs us and, and wants to be with us, and it's not an impossible and, or, an, or a movable, but he, he also cries for us and, and comes to, to help us. Uh, so why, that's why God is love. However, if we read his, his books, we will find that his definition of life is also the one of Plato and Aristotle as self-movement. We find there in, in the book called the, Li uh, the Living God. And then when he speaks about the crucified God or God's pathos would be like suffering, uh, we will see that for him, the love of God is something that he decides to do. I mean, God never loses its own autarchic and sovereignty. God is the one that chooses to come for us. Or God is the one that chooses to be moved by our prayers. But it is not that uh, God needs us. It is not that God is really dependent on us. The only thing that uh, changes here is that God tries to be with men and that one, well, okay, so Moldman say, okay, we have to think about he's not unmovable because if not, he, was, uh, he wouldn't be alive. We have to speak, okay, let us speak that God is a self-movable living being, but he's not unmovable. That means that he moves, yes, he has movements, he changes, yes, but only from his own decision. So even in Jürgen Moldman, the paradigm of autosufficiency is the same. And here is an interesting thing, and with this I, I finish this presentation. Obviously for Molman, the metaphysics of, of substance must be left aside. So he decides to try to think of God more as a subject or as a person. If we took God as a substance, the, the God will be always the same because his substance doesn't change. That was makes a substance a substance. But if he is historical, if he is a subject that reveals in history, Trinitari in a Trinitarian way, and so on, now how could we say that he is the same? So, and this is very interesting because he speaks about God's historical self sameness. And which is uh, the, the key word here? Faithfulness. Why? Because God is revealed in history as the one that makes promises to men. And we know that it is God that is being revealed because we know that that promises will be kept and will be accomplished. So that's the only sign of divinity that we have. That he is absolutely trustful. We can trust everything to God, because we know that God is unable to, um, how do you say, to, um, the, uh, to treason, uh, to, to contradict himself and to, to not uh, keep the, his promises. The opposite of trustful, uh, sorry. Uh, so you see that the paradigm is still the same. It's always the self as a prefix to say what life is. Okay, sorry. Okay, now, is self-sufficient? Sorry, I'm not that good with uh, the play of words, but self-sufficiency was the paradigm of biotheological uh, meaning of life in Western civilization. But is it the self-sufficient? Shouldn't we start to address to the essential phenomena of relationship 
within our own experience of life. Because if we think about the self as being the main prefix to be able to say that something is alive, then the relationship would be only an accidental thing that needs the imperfect living being. The perfect living being, if it is absolutely autarchic, it doesn't need any relation to be alive. So if we put the self first, then relationship comes to be troublesome. And then we have, like, in this past century, some thinkers uh, thinking about alterity as something that we have uh, to, to stress more than the, uh, the, uh, the self selfness. Why don't we put aside this prefix self to start thinking about life from its relational essence, not by its autarchical? I, don't, I know that the prefix self tells us very much about life because we experience it. We know that we are alive when we are able to breathe for ourselves. That is absolutely right. But the thing is, when we only grasp that feature and only that feature we try to describe all the richness of life, I think that that is the problem. So perhaps we could start a certain transition from the autos or self to the sin. Sin in, in Greek means together, with. Perhaps living would be living with others. Perhaps bios would be symbiosis or symbiosis. I don't know the answer. I don't have the metaphors. I don't have the concepts to open this new paradigm. But I just wanted to show what's the paradigm behind our discourses on life and to explicit that paradigm because only when we are uh, we are uh, conscient of that paradigm is that we can start to change or to to look for some way out out of it we don't know if there is something else after this paradigm but i think that we must try and the first task is to deconstruct what life means in Western civilization. So this is the beginning of our project. I know that it's uh, uh, very little, and I'm really sorry if I disappointed you, but uh, I would really love to have some commentaries and some questions, because I think uh, this is why I, I came for. So uh, thank you very much. questions and, and a few minutes for questions so why don't we start so yeah uh, thank you Martin I thought the talk was extremely rich and interesting I have what might be a clarificatory question or it might just be an endorsement of part of what you've said depending on what, what the answer is so um, what I wasn't quite clear on was where the initial plausibility of this idea of life as self-sufficiency is supposed to come from. So I can understand the idea that life involves self-governance uh, uh, or spontaneity, these kinds of things. But when, when you talk about self-sufficiency, you said something about um, uh, uh, a lack of uh, need for you know, uh, relations with the environment, input and output, that kind of thing. Now, all of that seems to me to be much more characteristic of the absence of life. So if you, if you, you know, put a put a rock in a room with nothing in it and put, put a cat in a, in a vault with nothing in it and wait for a while, when you, where the rock will be the same, but the cat will have died. Yeah. Okay, so, so it's, it's almost as though uh, what, what's characteristic of life is precisely the opposite of self-sufficiency. It's, it's rather that you need, as it were, a broken circle for things, for things to engage in a, uh, organic or, or uh, animated processes. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Yes, absolutely. That's why it struck me at first, because I always thought, I uh, assumed that life is to be related in some way with other living beings and with uh, non living beings as well. You know, I have uh, my wife and my kids, so I know that my life is, uh, all my life is there in that relationship, or the meaning of my life at least. I know it, it just runs there. So, 
what com came to my attention is that although we have this experience, when we go to the texts of philosophers, of biologists, of biologists, uh, biologists and, and of theologians, we will find that, yes, they, absolutely, they talk about relationship of living beings. I mean, Aristotle said that, uh, for instance, humans are um, political beings and have a word. So obviously, no, you will not find anyone that says life is self-sufficiency. But what's the problem? Is that when they have to define life, they don't define it from the uh, relational aspect, but only from their self or automobility. So in that sense, what I, uh, I, what I guess is that if we start from that point, then relationship would not mean much. And we can see that that happens mainly in theology, because it's in theology where we were going to find what is the perfect living being. And then, that is quite amazing, to see how theologians try to break their brain, to try to think about a perfect God that is in relation with humans. And, and how can we think of a crucified God, for instance? No? Isn't that uh, a contradiction? But why? If we started by uh, a relational essence of life, that wouldn't be a problem. But it is a problem because autosufficiency is the paradigm of life. And that puts into question this, the very being of God. So I think, yeah. I think it's, it's only an hypothesis, but I think that if we could shift from the primacy, the primacy I am not uh, talking about leaving aside self, but I'm, think, I'm thinking if we leave aside in a second place the self prefix and we put the with prefix before our vital experiences or activities, perhaps we can go further thinking about what life is. I, I don't know if I answered. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yep, let's go. Andrew, you have a question? Well, thank you, Martin. That was a... That was a very good, clear presentation. I really admire the way you approach the whole subject. I have Thank three you. suggestions for you. First of all, um, when it comes to self-sufficiency of living things, our, our understanding of a living thing is changing quite, quite radically at the moment. So we tend to think of living things as much more symbiotic anyway. I mean, each of us is a, is a whole zoo of living things, right? We carry around lots of DNA of other creatures with us, um, living with us, in us, all the time. So I think there's this aspect. And there are some animals which are actually colony animals, where it's hard to define precisely where is the form in Aristotelian terms. Is it the, the, the component or the whole? So I think it's worth thinking about some of these fuzzy cases, um, which is a different day to Aristotelian biology. The second suggestion I have for you is to think about the taxonomy of teleology, the taxonomy of teleology, because this is a whole world of debate. Um, you've chosen one kind of teleology, the self-making machine, which, by the way, wasn't new in the 70s. It goes back to cybernetics in the 30s, so people already started to think about these things. Um, but it's worth getting the, the terms clarified because teleology comes in different forms. You've got the f a physical system like a thermostat has got a kind of primitive teleology. Um, you've got cybernetics and self-making machines, but you've also got the re-emergence of genuine teleology, I would say, in complex systems. In complex systems, you've got um, three-body systems and so on, you've got end-directed action, which is not reducible to machine action. We can talk about this another time, but, but just be aware that, there's a that there is a complex world of different kinds of teleology uh, worth thinking about. And the final thing, a defense of Thomas Aquinas, because you've, um, you, you emphasize the unicity of God in Thomas Aquinas, and the danger is that um, if people look at just a fragment of his work, he, uh, he, looks, like, he looks like he presents a frozen God. Um, and when Professor Eleanor Stump came to Rome to teach, to teach us um, the theology of Thomas Aquinas, she started um, with the commentaries on the Gospel of John. So just to, just to help inoculate us, to cure us of the temptation to believe that Aquinas advocates a frozen God. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Yes, I, 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 my, I studied in, in Universidad Católica, of, uh, that's a Catholic university in Argentina, and they were a lot of, uh, of uh, tradition of St. Thomas. And I really love Thomas Aquinas. It's, uh, it may seem not, but it's, I really do. But when I, when I wanted to, to, to see how Thomas Aquinas was thinking about life, it interested me not his exegetical wor work, because then in exegetical, in Moldman is the same thing. Because I think it, that is like a problem. No, it's not a problem, but I mean, it's the, the very nature of theology that goes from exegetical works, but also to metaphysics or philosophical or systematical thought. So uh, I, I didn't want to go to the exegetical part, because then uh, the, the, the reasoning is another thing there. It, it is like another kind of, of message. It has another meaning. It has uh, like a, another kind of... Uh, how do you say it in Wittgenstein's science word like a uh, play of words no I don't want to sorry mm -hmm. so uh, I wanted to go to the systematic theology and then there I, I I found that even in Thomas Aquinas the li the um, life of God was thought of within the frame of the one God and the, the important thing there is the one God is not the living God so that was striking in a way but I don't think that this um, like problem with Thomas Aquinas I think that really that in, in Western civilization this idea has like monopolized the, the whole the whole uh, reflections on life and I think that today we, we, we give it uh, as granted and uh, we, we don't go and criticize that because it's very useful. We have lo made a lot of progress with that concept of life. And I, it's really helpful. I mean, we must uh, keep this self-prefix to speak about life. But the thing is that it gives us a lot of problems as well. You know? So uh, that's, that's why. You know? But yes, uh, of course, I didn't want to, to present a frozen god from Thomas Aquinas. Thank you. One yeah. final question. There, is an there were two of us, so yes. uh, maybe two. You know, uh, it's, uh, um, it's also maybe a question about clarification. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, so, um, you were sp uh, the title of your talk was, uh, could you please repeat? Yeah. Self-sufficiency, Self yes, yeah. as a biotheological paradigm. Bio, uh, so, okay. Bi biotheological, yeah. yeah. But yeah, no, I, I know. So. so I know what is ontotheology. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, uh -huh, yeah. Okay. So um, basically, you were critical about this concept of self self sufficiency as biotheological paradigm. Yeah. And fro and you try to explain that this is the way we perceive life. Yeah. Right. That's right. Okay. Uh, so um, maybe I, I'm not quite sure. Uh, is that completely correct? Because. Okay, we have this uh, autarkeia, uh, in, uh, but uh, like an ethical position in Stoics, and you were speaking about Aristotle's, um, which could be understood in this individualistic way, which can have some severe consequences. But if you are speaking about not concept of life just, but human being in general, we had this, um, and we are coming back to the field of ethics again. We have this shift even in classical German idealism uh, with uh, Kant and Fichte on the practical reason and the ethical dimension, uh, which is much more relational than like this self-sufficiency, which you are uh, taking as the main um, notion or the idea of understanding the life. Mm -hmm. So uh, basically my question would be, because I didn't understand quite correctly, uh, why do you take this like some kind of uh, historical overview of uh, dominant understanding of life. If, for example, in classical German idealism, we have already this shift towards practical and which is more ethical and relational. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for the question. Absolutely. For, first of all, I have to say, it's for at least I think, it's impossible to have a panoramic side from which we do this kind of deconstructive or archaeological work because we, we cannot, I mean, no, nobody I can, yeah, can, yeah, of course you can't. but nevertheless, it's quite interesting your, your 
your question because I think that even in Kant's um, turn into practical reason, we also will find the self-sufficiency as the main uh, biological paradigm in this way that for Kant the main uh, important the, the the most important thing in ethics is autonomy. So we we see auto uh, auto auto <laughs> again. Yeah, uh, we see the, that what really matters in Kant's uh, ethic is. I of course, yeah. but uh, what, that's what I I wanted to show as well. It's as the concept of life is not only biological, but it has primarily a, a human uh, meaning, then biology is crossed with ethical I and political. And so if he's talking about autonomy in the ethical side, we see that Maturana, for instance, in his preface was, was claiming the same. Ah, now that I thought of autopoiesis, now I think that I, I am the owner of my own life and that blah, blah, blah. No? So from ethics to biology and from biology to ethics, the, 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 the road is two-sided and we, ha and we can go from one to the other quite easily. And it's, in, it's interesting because if we take a thinker of alterity that would like put into question the self-sufficiency, you know, uh, at least in the frame of this, the theory of the subject, as the subject that's, that's been eccentric or been uh, taken out of its joint or whatever, as the, the one of Emmanuel Levinas, we will see that even Emmanuel Levinas, it's a Kantian thinker. And, and he's uh, speaking about responsibility and, and, and how the subjectivity answers to the other, but the community is put into question. For instance, he is critical of Martin Buber's I and Thou, because for him it's, oh, no, no, community must be left aside. This is, must be like a question of responding or answering to the other because I have to, or whatever. So I think that even in those thinkers of alterity, the paradigm is still very strong. The thing that will define our life, being human or being the life on a, of an insect or being the life of God, is the, the, that we are in control of our activities. That is the main thing. Then we see, I, perhaps I need another one. So if I am a dog, I will need my master to give me some care. But if I am God, that's the perfect living being, then I will not need nothing at all. And if I go and love you, it's because I decide to. It is not because I need you. So that, that's, I think we are still in the... I, I should um, uh, probably study much more of no, German no, idealism or... No, 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 uh, no, 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 but it's true, yeah. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm being told uh, <laughs> that, uh, that time has come for us to thank uh, Martin for stepping in. Thank you, thank you very much.